everybody to this joint CSIN and Karma webinar by Martin Wolf from St. Gallen University on monetary policy in the age of automation. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge and celebrate the first Australians on whose traditional lands we meet and pay our respects to the elders past and present. My name is Renee McKibben and I'm a professor of economics in the Karma at the ANU. Martin is an assistant professor of monetary economics at the University of St. Gallen. He's also affiliated with the CETR and obtained his PhD from the University of Bonn in 2017. We also have some other panelists um, who will join us either whenever they want to turn their camera on or at the end of um, Martin's presentation. We have Jose Karigadaliki and Ole Rommel from CSIN, Warwick McKibben from Karma, and Akshay Shankar from the University of New South Wales. Before I hand over to Martin, I would like to let you know that this event is being recorded and will be available on the Karma website in the next few days. If you would like to ask a question, please use the Q&A button on Zoom. If you would like to ask a question on person on the screen, please send me a private chat and I'll, I will invite you uh, to join the panel and ask your question on camera. So I'll now hand over to Martin. Thank you for joining us, Martin. Yeah, good morning, everyone, or good evening, everyone. Thank you very much for inviting me to the seminar. I'm very happy to, to be here. Um, let me share my slides. And I think I will start straight away. So the paper is titled um, Monet. Sorry, is it working? Okay, it's is, it is working now, yes. Okay, great. So the paper is titled Monetary Policy in the Age of Automation, and it's a joint paper with Luca Fonaro, who is a senior researcher at CREI in, uh, in Barcelona. So the question we ask in this paper is, what are the implications of automation for monetary policy? And we ask this question because, first of all, technological progress quite often takes the form of automation, that is capital replacing labor in performing tasks. So from that, from that alone, I think it's important to understand the links between monetary policy and automation. But also, more recently, there has been an active debate about the implications uh, of, uh, of automation for monetary policy. For instance, in the recent book, Martin Sandbu argues that maintaining a high pressure economy may be necessary to exploit the gains from automation, for otherwise <clears throat> the fact that automation accelerates may uh, displace labor and so may lead to high to high unemployment and the related uh, debate is surrounding biden's fiscal stimulus package so there are some people which say that that big package is so big it will it will just cause inflation overheating on the labor market but other people say that this expansionary macroeconomic environment may actually induce firms to to invest and um, perhaps to automate their production and as a result will lead to a higher long-run productivity rather than inflation but despite the importance of these debates, there's very little academic research on the topic. So in this model, uh, we uh, built on the standard model of automation, which has been proposed by Arthur Moglo and uh, Restrepo in 2018 in the AAR. So in this framework, capital and labor are highly substitutable. So in fact, perfect substitutes in performing some production tasks. So some goods can either be produced with capital or with labor. And macroeconomic conditions affect the intensity with which capital and labor are used to production. So the decision to automate is governed by macroeconomic conditions. Now, to be able to speak to monetary policy, we add to this standard framework, which we in fact simplify quite a bit relative to the original uh, AR paper. Uh, we had two novel ingredients. So first we had uh, rigid nominal rigidities, in particular nominal wage rigidities, so that monetary policy has real effects. And secondly, we add wealth in the utility function. So what that is doing, it, uh, it implies that there's a long run relationship between aggregate demand and the interest rate in the, in the economy. So in a standard representative agent setting, uh, the Euler equation by households would, would pin down uniquely the interest rate in the long run. So when the central bank changes the interest rate, so when in steady state, when it departs uh, from, this, from this level, then aggregate demand would collapse to plus or minus infinity. So what wealth and the utility is doing, it is it make, making this elasticity finite, so that even in steady state, a higher interest rate leads to a lower aggregate demand, but the response is finite. So the, the benefit of this assumption is that we can discuss our main insights using steady state analysis, which makes the model much more insightful and, and tractable. <clears throat> 
to preview the results, what we find is that uh, besides employment and inflation, which are the standard channels through which monetary policy operates, monetary policy in our framework also affects the use of automation and as a result, labor productivity. So let's, for instance, look at the, uh, at the effect of a monetary expansion. So in a traditional model, a cut in the interest rate, the monetary expansion would lead to a higher employment and inflation through the standard aggregate demand channel. Aggregate demand goes up, firms uh, satisfy this higher demand by hire, hiring more workers, and uh, that has also a positive effect on inflation. In our framework, uh, monetary expansion may raise automation and labor productivity even permanently while having little impact on employment and inflation. And to appreciate this point, let's, let's talk about inflation. So if the central bank cuts the interest rate, expansionary macroeconomic environment, um, that is making it in our model more attractive for firms to automate their production because investment becomes cheaper. But as automation increases, this displaces labor, which goes against the boom in, in employment that is typically associated with a monetary expansion. So from that, you see that a monetary expansion can be associated with, with little impact on employment. What about inflation? Well, if the labor market does not overheat, because there's at the same time this uh, displacement effect due to automation, uh, then there's no pressure on wages to increase. So that's why inflation need also not increase. And additionally, the fact that labor productivity goes up uh, when there's more automation also depresses uh, inflation. So from, there, from those arguments, you can see why in our framework, monetary expansion may not be associated with rises in employment and inflation, but, can, but will be associated with rises in automation and labor productivity. And you will see that this can even be permanently the case. So a temporary monetary expansion in our framework can even lead to a permanently higher labor productivity. Secondly, uh, so here we've talked about the effects of monetary policy in the economy, how they are different, but we also look at how changes in macroeconomic conditions affect monetary policy differently compared to a standard framework. So the first experiment that we look at is weak aggregate demand, a long spell of weak demand, like uh, perhaps due to the forces emphasized by the secular stagnation literature. And in our uh, framework, weak aggregate demand may induce a process of de-automation and lower labor productivity. Whereas in standard frameworks, weak aggregate demand would lead to deflation, deflationary pressure and unemployment. And then finally, we also talk about the sun pool point, which is uh, higher automation. Uh, would it give rise to unemployment? And we find this confirmed. So rising automation in our model may in cause involuntary unemployment unless, unless it is accompanied by expansionary monetary policy. Okay, so that's the outline for the rest of the talk. I will first talk about the model, then we will cast our, I would say, main results in the steady state analysis. Then we talk about temporary monetary policy interventions out of steady state, and then monetary policy challenges. So the model, uh, so it's a closed economy, and uh, the economy is populated by a large number of identical households. So we have a representative household setting with the following lifetime utility. And so consumption part is standard, that is a labor, this utility from labor supply. The only thing that is new compared to a standard framework is this Xi, and that is the wealth and utility. So households derive extra utility from holding wealth. So wealth being either in the form of bonds or in the form of capital, we have both in the model. So this is the budget constraint. Uh, so households can consume, invest in capital, invest in bonds, they have labor income, and that's income from capital and bonds in the last period. Uh, we, throughout the paper, we use the assumption that the fridge elasticity of labor supply is zero. So we take eta to plus infinity. What this implies, it simplifies the model. It simplifies it because when the uh, fridge elasticity is zero, then household's labor supply uh, is just LT is equal to L bar independent of the real wage. So that applies a vertical labor supply curve. That's just simplifying the model. So, we, so household's desired labor supply is L bar. Uh, but as you will see, due to wage rigidities, households in equilibrium may not supply L bar, they may supply more or less, more or less than that. And the other optimality conditions are two Euler equations. So first equation, uh, Euler equation for bonds, and then there's the second for capital. Once you combine the two, you get the indifference condition, so that returns must be equalized. That's the real interest rate, and that's the return to capital. And uh, here, again, the wealth and utility function uh, term appears, so you can see that there's a uh, an additional benefit of saving compared to a model without wealth and utility. 
Now let's come to the firm side. Um, the final good uh, is produced by competitive firms by using a continuum of in intermediate inputs or tasks. So at Jamoglu, they always talk, or talk of tasks in these frameworks. So that's these YJTs. And uh, they, they sell at the price PJT and profit maximization from final good firms implies the, the standard demand functions where PJT is this, the price in terms of the final good. Now the interesting stuff happens in the intermediate goods sector where these YJTs are produced. So here we have to distinguish three cases. So this is where automation comes in. So first of all, <clears throat> there's a bunch of inputs which can be produced with capital only. So low index uh, intermediate inputs, they can be produced only with capital. So those should be thought of as very capital intensive uh, intermediate inputs, like for instance, pressing a car. <clears throat> so something that can really only be done with, with capital. Then there are inputs uh, which can be produced using either capital or labor. So those are uh, inputs which are, which can in principle be automated. So here the production technology is linear. So these can be yeah, some tasks that have been automated recently. I don't know. I think you have examples, <clears throat> right? So that can be produced either with capital or labor. And then finally, we have another set of inputs. So those are the high index tasks. They can be produced only with labor. So those are uh, tasks that are very uh, intensive in labor. Maybe walking your dog in the park would be an example that is probably hard to automate. But you can also think of the JH as capturing technological constraints on automation. So perhaps in the future, JH will be higher such that tasks which were previously could not be automated can then, can then be automated. So we have these three, uh, these three regions. Now, all these intermediate goods are produced under perfect competition. So these firms <clears throat> within each sector J, firms take this, the price PJT is given and also the, the cost of these inputs, the factor prices. And as a result, perfect competition implies that the price is equal to the marginal cost and the marginal cost is the following. So for low index uh, intermediate inputs, it's just the cost of capital. So it's uh, the return to capital divided by the productivity of capital, gamma K. For intermediate tasks, it's the minimum between uh, the capital and labor. And this is because they, these firms face a linear production technology. So these firms will, whenever, whenever capital is cheap, compared to labor, then they will choose to produce with capital. And whenever capital is expensive, they will choose to produce with labor. <coughs> Sorry, I, <clears throat> I still have a bit of a cold. <laughs> Sorry, so I'm, my voice is a bit problematic. Finally, the last case would be the high uh, index tasks. <clears throat> and for those, the price is just, uh, is just the, the wage. Now, next we define JT star such that, so that's the threshold JT star, such that all intermediate goods <clears throat> with J below the threshold are produced with capital and the rest with labor. So we can distinguish three cases. So if the cost of capital is high, then, <coughs> then only low, <coughs> low index tasks will be produced with uh, capital. If the cost of capital equals the wage, then JT star will be somewhere between JL and JH. And we call this intermediate automation. And if the cost of capital is low, oh, sorry, my voice is leaving me. <laughs> Martin, if you would like to just pause for a minute and um, I can edit this bit out of the recording if you want to go, if you want to have a, get a glass of water or something. <clears throat> yeah, that would be great. Thank you. I'm back in a second. I'll just press pause. I thought <clears throat> I brought some draggies and some water. I hope it's now. It's not better. All right. Yeah, so in summary, high wage relative to high cost of capital implies more automation. Now the nice feature about having this intermediate good sector in this type is that once you go back to the final good sector, this slide, everything adds up to a standard framework. So in reduced form, you end up with a Cobb-Douglas production function. The only difference to the standard framework is that the JT star, which is the capital share, is now endogenous. So this is now determined by macroeconomic conditions. But apart from that, you can think that the firm sector is characterized by a super standard 
Cobb-Douglas production function. And as a result, we get all the typical results from Cobb-Douglas production functions, like for instance, equilibrium factor prices satisfy this equation and factor shares are given by that. Now, we add nominal rigidities to be able to speak about monetary policy. So what we do is we simply add a wage Phillips curve, but results would be very similar if we had a forward looking Phillips curve. So we just assume that the wage, wage inflation is increasing in heat in the labor market. So in particular, when employment is above the natural level of employment, L bar, so re remember that that is household's desired labor supply, uh, then there will be wage inflation. And if it's below, then there will be deflation of wages. And then from the firm side, uh, we can also back out <clears throat> what, will you, what will be the price of the final good. Uh, so that would be uh, the equation pinning down inflation as a function of wage inflation. And finally, monetary policy controls the interest rate. And because the wage stickiness implies that also prices are sticky, so monetary policy can also influence the real interest rate. Finally, market clearing for the final good. So output produced must either be consumed or invested and the labor market clears like this. So either there's the natural level of employment or there's involuntary unemployment or there's overheating. Now, unless you have questions, I would move on to the steady state analysis. So to study the effects of monetary policy in this economy, we focus first on steady states. And moreover, we organize the discussion around the effects of monetary policy on employment. So in traditional models, monetary expansion would raise employment. I've said, this in the, in, I've said that in the introduction. So expansions raise aggregate demand and firms re, uh, react by hiring more workers. But in our uh, framework, monetary expansions have actually non-monotonic employment effects. And by tracing labor demand, so by understanding the labor market, we will also be able to understand the other aspects of monetary intervention. So we will understand the effect of monetary policy on wages, inflation, productivity, and so on. But so, so let's organize the discussion around employment. So the key question when you, when you look at employment is how does a change in the interest rate in steady state affect, labor de uh, uh, affect the equilibrium labor <clears throat> or affect labor demand in the steady state? Now, what is labor demand in the steady state? You just use firm's first order condition for labor, which looks like this. So, uh, so this is basically the factor shares condition, uh, that one here, and then replacing the W by using that equation. So by using this equation, you can see that there are three effects on labor demands. So first, that's what we call the automation effect. That is the fact that the J star is endogenous in our framework. Right? It can happen that firms shed labor because they substitute uh, some production task, which they previously performed with, uh, with labor and now with capital. <clears throat> so the J star would go up, labor demand would go down. The second effect is what we call the capital deepening effect. That is the fact that when the interest rates are low, then firms substitute um, so basically firms, final good firms use those intermediate inputs which are produced with capital more intensively. So it's an intensive margin. So capital deepening is also there in standard models. That's an intensive margin. When interest rates are low, you use capital more intensively, whereas automation is an extensive margin. So this is really about the, the capital share, the share of, of tasks that you produce with capital. Okay, so, and then there's the aggregate demand uh, channel. So what are these, the three effects that we talk about? So aggregate demand would mean interest rate goes down, aggregate demand goes up, and as a result, labor demand goes up. So that has a positive aggregate demand going up has a positive effect on labor demand. What about capital deepening? Why well, capital deepening means interest rate goes down, the capital, so firms wanna use capital more intensively, as a result, they will use labor less intensively. So you see that this effect here has a negative effect on the, <clears throat> on the L. So here when the interest rate falls, then also L would go down. And finally, automation is the same. So when the interest rate goes down, it may lead, so expansionary monetary environment, it will lead to higher automation by firms. You will see that in a second, as a result, labor demand goes down. Now, let me say that what is distinguishing in our framework, the distinguishing feature is the first part, automation, whereas capital deepening and aggregate demand are there also in standard frameworks. So this is the new part. Now let's talk, uh, let's, let's go through three cases. So it turns out that we can trace the labor demand curve as a function of the level of the interest rate set by monetary policy. 
So when the interest rate is sufficiently tight, so there's a threshold level in our model, which we call I bar, when monetary policy is sufficiently tight, then it's optimal for firms to use capital not very intensively in production, but use labor very intensively. <clears throat> so uh, automation is, is very low. So the production function simplifies then to Cobb Douglas where the uh, capital share is just JL. And in that case, uh, we, we make assumptions such that the effect, uh, the aggregate demand effect dominates the capital deepening effect, such that when the interest rate falls, labor demand goes up. Um, <clears throat> so the labor demand curve looks like this. Okay, so when the interest rate is high, a lower interest rate leads to more demand for labor from firms. Now, let me say one thing quickly on, on this point, AD effect dominates. So this is the standard assumption in the literature. So it also happens for very plausible parameters that the aggregate demand effect always dominates the capital deepening effect. So there, we are not doing anything new here. So the aggregate demand effect dominates. Now, partial automation. So what happens when the central bank happens to set the interest rate exactly to the level I bar? Then firms are indifferent between any level JL and JH. And so labor demand becomes the following equation. So it collapses to this. And what you can see here is that any level of aggregate demand that you wish can be produced by different combinations of L and J star. So you can have a high J star and a low L, or you can have a high L and a low J star. What that means intuitively is that firms can choose now to produce this, the, the same amount of output, either by using a lot of machines or by using a lot of uh, labor. Okay, so they are indifferent between the two because of the perfect substitutability. Now, graphically, what this adds is a, is a, a horizontal piece to the labor demand curve. <clears throat> now, finally, high automation. So that, that is the case when the interest rate is sufficiently low. So when the macroeconomic environment is sufficiently expansionary, in that case, firms find it very attractive to invest in automation. Uh, so the production function becomes Cobb Douglas with high intensity of capital. And when you trace marginal effects, again, of, uh, of cuts in the interest rate, again, the aggregate demand effect dominates in this region, such that labor demand becomes again downward sloping. So overall, labor demand, the labor demand curve looks like this. And the important feature is that you see that it's non-monotonic. So in a standard framework, it would just be a line which goes down. In our framework, there's a part which comes back. And this has important implications. So for instance, when you uh, think about uh, the natural level of employment, so the natural level of employment could be, for, for example, here. So in that case, there would still be an, a unique steady state, but there would still be these uh, unconventional features here in this region. Or you can uh, even, either th uh, even think of cases where there are multiple full employment steady states. Okay, so let me summarize. So in our model, monetary expansion raises aggregate demand, but it may also induce firms to automate their production. When this happens, labor demand may decline. So that's the labor demand side. But moreover, this boost in automation, of course, also raises investment, the capital stock, labor productivity, and therefore wages. So when you, for instance, uh, look at these three different steady states. So the, this high automation steady state will come with a higher capital stock and would come with higher wages and higher productivity. So through this effect, if this effect is strong enough, there can even be multiple steady states where employment equals its natural level and inflation is a target. So you can see that uh, what central banks are doing in this model is completely different compared to a standard model. For instance, if central banks narrowly focus on inflation and employment, they may not even pin down the economy's long-run equilibrium. So there can be different long-run equilibria. Like monetary policy can be expansionary. Employment equals its natural level and inflation is on target. But, uh, uh, but here there's high automation, high investment, high capital stock, and here there's a low automation, low capital stock. Okay, so <clears throat> the the, the effects of monetary policy are not, should not just be thought of in terms of having effects on employment and inflation, but also m uh, broader, broader implications for the economy. Now, before I move on, very briefly, um, let me mention that, so in our model, this is obviously extreme. So we're making an assumption such that all firms find it attractive at the same level of interest rates to switch to a high use of automation in production. So in reality, that will probably be a bit more uh, gradual. So some firms <clears throat> find it uh, attractive earlier to automate their production. And for some firms, you need a bit of a, a bigger boost in terms of uh, low interest rates for them to automate their production. So we have an extension in the model where we do that. 
So this is the, a model where uh, the productivity of labor basically varies smoothly in the task index J. So this is actually a Timocris framework. Uh, so in that case, you can see that as you lower the interest rate, you, you gradually crowd in uh, automation in the economy. And the labor demand curve looks now smoother, but you see that uh, the important feature that it, it has this backward bending part that is, that is still the case. Okay, but we find it convenient to work with this model because it, uh, it's more tractable. Good, having looked at steady states, now let, let's look at temporary interventions. So we look at temporary out of steady state monetary policy interventions. And in particular, we will study two experiments. Uh, the first experiment is that the central bank engineers a drop in the real interest rate and then returns to the initial steady state. So it's like a monetary policy shock. The second experiment would be central bank engineers a drop in the real interest rate, but then sets the interest rate to close the output gap. So basically first depart from the steady state and then set the interest rate equal to its natural level. And in both cases, we assume the economy is initially in the low automation steady state. By the way, how much time do I have? Um, I'm a bit lost in terms of time. Um, you have another good 15 minutes, and then you'll have 15 oh. minutes still available for questions. So there's 30 minutes in total left. Okay, thank you. So experiment one, so that is the temporary cut in the interest rate then return to steady state. <clears throat> so here we assume that the central bank cuts the interest rate by 2%. And what that is enough, basically, in order to fall below this I bar. So in this experiment, um, we start from low automation, so the interest rate is in, uh, initially quite high. The central bank cuts the interest rate and cuts it by enough <clears throat> in order to trigger firms to change their use of automation in production, because it cuts the interest rate below I bar, which was this threshold level. Now, what are the effects? So there's a big output boom. And then employment and labor productivity. So what, what I wish to highlight is that, so first of all, <clears throat> here there's still an output boom, but employment is already below, uh, is, is here below, uh, below the natural level. Okay, so what's going on here? There's an economic boom, but at the same time, firms find it optimal to automate part of their production. So even though output is high, employment can be low. So that is the effect of automation. So a, a monetary expansion can have very uh, surprising effects on employment in our model. And you see that labor productivity is going up big time here. That is because of automation is, is increasing. <clears throat> now we contrast this with a model of exogenous automation. So this is just assuming that firms do not have this decision. And you can see that the effect is basically that the employment re uh, response is uh, monotonic. So this is really the new feature of our model that the uh, employment response is, is different in terms of this, this analysis. What about inflation? Well, <clears throat> typically inflation is going up. So this is wage inflation. So in standard models, inflation would be increasing because of overheating in the labor market. And in our model, that may not be the case. So you see that wage inflation can decline um, because exactly there's involuntary unemployment associated with a boom. So even though there's a boom, output is going up, we can have inflation below targets due to these effects. And this carries over to price inflation. Summary, monetary expansion boosts automation and labor productivity. Higher automation puts downward pressure on labor demand. And as a result, there's an output boom with involuntary unemployment and deflation possible. But what we also highlight is that these effects are extremely non-linear in our model. <clears throat> uh, okay, the there's a question about the liquidity trap. I will come to that in a second. But these effects are extremely non-linear. So first of all, there's a time dependency. So you can see that impact of, on automation arises in the medium run. So you see that a disemployment effect is not immediately on impact, <clears throat> but it's only in the medium run because firms take time in order to automate their production. So that's a gradual process. So we have a time dependency, but we also have a size dependency, which is because only a sufficiently large rate cut can foster automation. So again, here we have assumed that the central bank cuts the interest rate below this I bar. But if you consider a, a very small change in the interest rate locally, so like this, <clears throat> then these effects would not arise because monetary policy must be sufficiently accommodative or expansionary in order to trigger firms to change their use of automation in production. <clears throat> 
And finally, there's also a state dependency which is monetary expansions only affect automation if there's a backlog of unused automation technologies. So remember that we assumed uh, that this expansion starts from a state where we have a low state of automation, right? Initially in the low automation steady state. So that means that you can crowd in automation by cutting the interest rate. But when, when you already start in the high automation steady state and you cut the interest rate, then the only thing you will get is the standard effect, higher uh, employment overheating in the labor market and way, uh, high inflation, okay? So these effects only arise um, when you have a backlog of unused automation technologies that you can crowd in. Experiment two, so remember that experiment two was cutting the interest rate <clears throat> and then setting the interest rate to close the output gap. So interest rate equal the natural level. What happens in this case, it looks like this. So the, uh, there are no numbers because the numbers are still a bit crazy. We are still working on making this a bit more quantitative. But the big, basically the big uh, thing that happens is you cut the interest rate uh, temporarily and then you close the output gap. What happens is that with this policy, you trigger an initial overheating in the labor market. So an initial employment boom. Um, you crowd in a lot of investment. And that has the effect of lifting the economy in the long run to the high automation steady state. So you can see that after the cut in the interest rate, it converges permanently to a lower level and output converges permanently to a different level, <clears throat> right? So that is the original steady state, that is the final steady state. And uh, yeah, and employment will be the same in the, in the first and the final steady state. So yeah, we are still working on a bit better graphs, but basically what comes out is when you have a, this type of monetary experiment, a temporary overheating can even trigger the, uh, a transition to the high automation steady states. So monetary policy can move the economy from one steady state to the other. And like I said, the intuition is a policy easing causes a rise in investment, initially overheating the labor market, but in the long run, output and real wages rise because of higher use of automation in production and the overheating in the labor market disappears. And, uh, <clears throat> and so inflation is also not going to be higher in the, in the long run. So monetary expansions can even raise labor productivity permanently in this framework without long run effects on employment and inflation. So this was one of the motivations that I gave in the beginning, the debate about Biden's uh, stimulus package. So this is speaking to that. But of course, we have to bear in mind <clears throat> that this, these effects happen only if the economy starts from the low automation steady state and multiple steady states are possible, right? If this is not the case, then uh, this policy would just lead to overheating and inflation. Okay, now let's come to monetary policy challenges. So this is also including the zero lower bound. So we have established to this point that in presence of automation, monetary interventions have unconventional effects. We now look at the other, uh, take a different perspective. We now show that in presence of automation, changes in macroeconomic conditions may also pose unconventional challenges for monetary policy. And what we start first is a long spell of weak aggregate demand, secular stagnation, <clears throat> and second, if we have time, a rise in automation. Now, how do we introduce weak demand in the model? We simply change the wealth and utility term in household's objective by adding a part e to the power of zeta. And uh, we ca capture a persistent rise in the zeta. So basically there's a persistent households flee into safe assets basically. So there's this, <clears throat> they have suddenly this desire to save in terms of bonds. And uh, what this is doing is it is decreasing aggregate demand. So when zeta is going up permanently, then aggregate demand is also going to go down permanently. Um, now, to make this problem interesting, we assume that there's a lower bound on the policy rate. So the central bank targets the natural level of employment, but if, the, if there's involuntary unemployment, then the central bank will set the interest rate to, to, to its lower bound. Now, let's come back to the labor demand diagram. So this would be the high demand economy before the shock. So labor demand looks like this. We assume that <coughs> um, we are in a situation where, um, where there are multiple steady states possible, high automation, low automation. And the, here there's the, uh, the zero lower bound on the policy rate. Now what, is, what happens when there's the change in aggregate demand? So persistent drop in demand will shift down labor demand basically. So for any level of interest rate, firms or it shifts it to the left. For any level of interest rates, firms will demand less labor, right? Because when there's less demand, there's no point hiring a lot of, uh, of workers. So there's this effect of shifting labor demand to the left. 
Now, what you can see is that the high automation steady state, uh, sorry, the high, the low automation steady state is still here as before, and the high automation steady state is now here. So it is associated with the interest rate at the zero lower bound and involuntary unemployment because labor demand uh, is below the natural level of employment. So if demand is too low, the high automation steady state with employment at its natural level is no longer attainable. So this, what this suggests is that there's a trade-off in, the, in, the, in this context between employment and inflation because the central bank can now choose uh, if in the long run it wants to be in this steady state or in this steady state. So if the central bank wants to be in this steady state, that will be a steady state where automation is still high, so there's still buoyant investment, um, but there's involuntary unemployment, right? Because the macroeconomic environment is not expansionary enough to sustain full employment despite a high use of automation in production. But the central bank can also choose this steady state. So that steady state would be a steady state where there is full employment and inflation on target, but there's low investment because interest rates are too high for, for firms to, uh, to, uh, to, for it to be profitable that there's a high use of automation in production. So by raising the interest rate, <coughs> the central bank can actually also move the economy to this steady state. So this suggests that there's a trade-off between employment and automation in our model. There's a question in the chat. And that's just me. The, um, the Q and A function doesn't seem to be working properly. So uh, okay. I just told everyone to put the questions in the chat. Yeah. Okay. So you see, the model suggests that there's this trade-off between em employment and, uh, and automation. And what you can also see is that if demand even falls even more, then uh, the high automation steady state disappears altogether. So basically. <clears throat> mm, If, if, uh, if demand falls even more, then this curve would shift down even more. And so basically this steady state would disappear. So you see that it's a really downward shift and then this steady state would disappear. So in that case, uh, the high automation steady state disappears altogether. So what, what, which would imply that uh, <clears throat> if demand is very weak in our model, that may actually trigger uh, a period of sustained disinvestment and de-automating production of firms. But in the long run, the labor market is actually doing fine because we are just converging to the steady state where there's low automation in production and uh, but still high, high employment. So we think that there, there's a link to the UK productivity puzzle. Uh, so the UK productivity puzzle is that um, after the financial crisis, there was a, a long spell of weak investment, weak productivity growth in the UK. Um, but there was actually robust employment. <clears throat> so maybe that is a case where the, the lack of demand has uh, triggered the process of uh, basically firms not investing very much, but rather uh, using labor uh, to in, in production. Okay, so maybe that's a result of the long spell of weak aggregate demand. Okay, and the last experiment is a rise in automation. So that's Martin Sandbu's point that we discussed in the beginning. So suppose that the scope for automation increases, so JH is going up. Remember that JH is a parameter and we treated it, so that's the threshold above which <clears throat> um, tasks or intermediate inputs must be produced with labor. And I, I already said before that this can also be thought of as a technological constraint on automation. So when JH is higher, it means that more intermediate goods can be automated. So let's assume that JH is increasing this parameter. So there's more scope for automation. Yes, there's a question. No, no question? Okay, then let me move on. So suppose that the scope for automation increases. What this is doing in the model, it, it is changing the labor demand curve in this way. So you can see that the high automation steady state is now again at the zero lower bound and again associated with involuntary unemployment. So basically, a high use of automation in production gives the same challenges to monetary policy as a spell of weak aggregate demand that's very similar. So to maintain the economy at full employment, the central bank may need to cut interest rates, expansionary macroeconomic environment, but it can, it can also be <clears throat> not possible for the central bank to do that because of the zero lower bound. In this case, a rise in automation can generate a liquidity trap within voluntary unemployment. Okay, so against the backdrop of weak demand, a rise in automation can even be weather reducing by replacing labor. So if we are originally initially in this situation and now there's an, in, so we are in this steady state and now there's a boost in uh, automation, then the only effect of automation will be 
to move the economy to the left, so there will be even more that more um, unemployment. <clears throat> okay, so against the backdrop of weak demand, the rise in automation can be can be a, a big problem. Okay, so I think I'm probably pretty good on time. So let me conclude. Uh, so we have proposed a framework where monetary policy. Uh, not just affects employment and inflation in the usual ways, but monetary policy can also affect uh, firms' use of uh, uh, automation. So firms, how much firms choose to automate their production. And as a result, monetary policy has also very different effects on labor productivity than in standard frameworks. So monetary interventions have very non-conventional effects. And one, one of the implications was that if central banks narrowly focus on inflation and employment, then they may not be able to steer the economy very well because they influence these automation margins into which are in the background and that may have very, <clears throat> very surprising effects on, on the economy. And uh, secondly, changes in macroeconomic conditions also have unconventional implications for monetary policy. So monetary policy should be aware of these trends in the background to, to be able to do, a, I think, a good, a good monetary policy. Okay, thank you. That's, that's it. Oh, thank you, Martin. No, I don't know why I've got my hand up. Okay, um, I'll ask our panelists to turn on their cameras um, now. And uh, Martin, it might be easier if you just turn off your slide sharing just so we can uh, see people a little more. Um, we did have one question in the chat from Chiara Odani. Did you get to answer that? Thank you for the interesting paper. How does the central bank get out from the liquidity trap in this framework? How does unconventional monetary policy fit in this framework? Uh, yeah, so we only talk about conventional monetary policy, but uh, not about unconventional. Um, but that, that, that is the slide on the liquidity trap. So here would be the liquidity trap. <clears throat> and uh, basically what the central bank can do to get out of the liquidity trap is just raise interest rates. Because <laughs> it's a bit surprising, but if it raises interest rates, what it does is it makes it, it, makes it less attractive for firms to, to, uh, uh, to invest in automation technologies. And as a result, these firms will basically shed some of their machines and, and, and uh, this, so there would be slower investment going forward and more labor demand, right? Because there will be, <clears throat> uh, production will be more, become more labor intensive again. And as a result, the economy can converge to this steady state in the long run, where there's a low use of automation in production, but still full employment in the labor market and inflation on target. So I think that's, that's one of the surprising implications of our framework, that this is how you can get out of a liquidity trap. Thank you. Um, Warwick, I think you have a question. Yeah, thank, thanks, Martin. That's really interesting. I had a couple of questions. Um, one is the way you put debt into the model. You don't have any taxation, so the consumers are regarding debt as net wealth. So I, I just wondered whether that was actually going to have an influence on the result. If these consumers were completely Ricardian, then that that's preference shift shouldn't, shouldn't have the effects you're talking about, I don't think. Okay, but in equilibrium, B is equal to zero in our framework. <clears throat> so that is just, um, so the only utility that agents derive in equilibrium from wealth is uh, breath from capital accumulation. The B, we just introduced it to be able to get the Euler equation so that monetary policy can influence the economy. But in equilibrium, B is equal to zero. Sorry, I didn't show that. Um, okay. Yeah. Second question is, um, this reminds me a lot about the, a lot, a lot of the papers that Bill Nordhaus did on singularity and um, the move towards singularity. And one of the nice things in that paper was he used his theoretical model to, to actually use empirical inputs to see whether we could identify where we were in this complex diagram. I'm wondering, it, it, it might be that what you're talking about is, is so far out of the realm of where we actually are or ever could be. So I'm wondering, um, can you quantify it in such a way that you can actually tell by recent movements in variables where you might be on that diagram? Because that's very important your policy conclusion on getting out of liquidity trap, if you're right, that's important. But if you're wrong, you create yeah. a disaster. So you yeah, need, exactly. we need to identify where we are. Yeah, no, it's a good point. So that's, um, that's uh, uh, this, um, uh, <clears throat> these policy experiments that may be a bit surprising, they only work if we are in a state such that they work, right? Because there must be, for instance, a backlog of uh, unused automation technologies in order to crowd in automation when you cut the interest rate. So it's, it's very important to know where we are. So we are, <clears throat> I think the point of this paper is more to raise the awareness that this, 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 this trade-off exists and is, is possibly there in the background. But then to, to know where we are, it's very, yeah, it's very hard. So of course, in the model, <clears throat> the central bank in the model has a, has a way to identify where it is. For instance, um, yeah, uh, you can real wages 
yeah, it's real wages are higher in the in the high automation steady state and in the low automation steady state. And uh, there's a parametric condition for that. So you know exactly where the wages and that so the central bank could check that. But of course, in practice, it's a bit harder to say if uh, we are <clears throat> in one or the other regime. Yeah. So this, this, so the, this paper is really not meant to be quantitative. So this is really just to highlight these channels, but, but, you, but you're right. In, in practice, it's certainly very important to know uh, how we can quantify that. Okay. You're muted. No, thanks. I just assume you. Sorry. <laughs> right. So uh, I, have, I have lots of questions and points, but I just want to state, state a couple of things. First, this is quite fundamental, right? So in the motivation, uh, it, it would be nice to discuss the whole relationship between relative factor prices and factor shares, the whole Uzawa theorem literature and the sort of deeper growth theory stuff. Um, so now in relation to that, what I don't seem to understand is if interest rates are affecting this JH, which is this capital share in the Cobb Douglas production function, right? No, the JH is a parameter. So they the are J affecting the J, the J star, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so why has it in the past, so th th this is the kind of debate, whether or not the capital share is now constant in the long run or whether we're trying to trending upwards. Um, and I, I'm not entirely sure whether that's been completely resolved. So it, it sort of, yeah. this literature so seems to be breaking away from what we've seen in the last hundred years of growth theory, which seems to suggest that all technological change is labor augmenting. So it's, it's Harrod neutral or I think Harrod neutral, yeah. And yeah. now we're kind of saying, yeah, we can get capital augmenting technical change. So this is capital augmenting technical change spurred on by a scale effect by a fall in the capital input price. So it's kind of like, why should that suddenly be happening now when I'm not sure in the data? Uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure if it's, a, if it's the same. So I think, <clears throat> so here, so interest, so basically when interest rates fall, uh, this makes it for, uh, cheap for firms to, uh, to use uh, to move out of labor and into capital, but it's not that you're investing in order to make one cap one factor cheaper, but you're simply escaping the factor altogether by by producing with another factor. Right? So when you think mm -hmm. of labor, like labor, labor augmenting, if I'm not wrong, labor augmenting technical change would be to invest <coughs> to get your labor costs down. But here it's uh, basically you're escaping labor altogether. You're just substituting out of the factor altogether, and you're producing with machines instead so it's a i think it's a different type of technology then it's not so there's <clears throat> when you think of a standard production function then you can have labor augmenting and tech and, and capital augmenting right so the two different a's one multiplying k and one multiplying l it's not the same so achimoglu is making is making this point in his papers that this is really a completely different type of technology i think that's also why uh, this, this automation papers have appeared only recently because it's uh, it's very new how you actually uh, how you actually model automation. So it's it shouldn't be modeled as labor or capital augmenting uh, technological change. So okay. it's really different. I guess, the, I guess it would be nice to connect that point. I don't know if you you do it or whether someone else does it. But yeah, I, it's still a question in my head. Um, secondly, just justifying this framework. Um, particularly the Asimoglu Restrepo framework and whether or not, I don't know if that new paper, that Ben Mole paper has some sort of data on, on whether or not this framework is consistent with what we see in data, I'm not sure. And, and whether or not, if we don't, if we go, if we say move to a more traditional labor capital augmenting technical change paper, how, how the results are different. Um, I guess, yeah, th those are my main, um, yeah, so Archer Moglo is actually, uh, he has a bunch of papers on, on automation and uh, the AER paper is very technical. So he just uh, explains how this framework works um, and with a lot of details, but he also has a few, like uh, one in Journal of Economic Perspectives uh, where he explains basically why this is a one in AER PMP, uh, why, why this is a good framework to explain what has been going on uh, in, 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 the, in the last decades. <clears throat> so okay. first he makes the case empirically that automation is really a phenomenon that is, that is very important in the sense that when you look at uh, labor uh, growth in the last decades, employment growth, a big part of that has been due to automation. So when you look at job postings uh, uh, in the last years, um, what you see is that many of job postings in the last years 
are really new jobs, jobs that haven't existed <coughs> in uh, before, right? So that that haven't existed in the past. So you see that the labor market changes fundamentally uh, in the sense that there are some new tasks being created, other tasks, uh, tasks being automated uh, and so on. So he, in, in these papers, he makes the case that this is empirically uh, very, very relevant to think about um, automation. So we are not, but in terms of our framework, <clears throat> So you're right that we have these implications for the capital share. So if the central bank uh, <clears throat> moves the economy from one steady state to the other, it will permanently raise the capital share, right? And so I'm not convinced the capital share is increasing. That's like, my, <laughs> yeah. I, I think I've ranted on to you about that before. But <clears throat> that's, a good, that's a good point, yeah. So I guess I'm trying to look for a, a <clears throat> deeper link between this, what you've got here and the standard Uzawa theorem kind of growth thing, which doesn't even require any equilibrium. It's just, uh, like growth accounting. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah that would yeah. be interesting. Okay, that's a good point. Thank that. you. And maybe what you're saying will hold in a standard uh, sort of labor augmenting technical change model. I'm not sure. Yeah, so there's one paper by Achim Mugler where he compares all of, the, I think it's the AERPP paper where he compares uh, all these different types of technology and how they affect different the labor share, capital share, wages, productivity, and so on. So he, he makes the point where that they, these are all different types of uh, te technology change and um, that uh, where are the differences. Okay. So, yeah. Cool. Does anyone else have any questions? Uh, I've got, I don't know whether it's a question, questions or thoughts or, or nonsense or whatever, but I was sort of struck by, by two things. And I think my thoughts dovetail nicely with, 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 with Warwick's questions. So my, my, I was struck by, you know, the sort of flat bit of, of the curve where mm -hmm. basically firms can, you know, achieve the equilibrium with any combination of labor, uh, of, of, of automation and, and labor. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering whether, you know, you can introduce a wolf automation fairy, just like the Calvo pricing fairy that determines how many firms or what share of firms automate, are allowed to automate, uh, and, and a share of firms that do not aut automate or that, um, I mean, that makes yeah. the whole thing much, much more complicated, but, you know, that may be something testable whether the the degree the the degree of automation is what you find in the data um yeah i don't know whether that, that's sort of feasible or practical yeah yeah so um okay yeah um so first i the um, that brings me to the other model that i've shown where the labor demand curve is backward bending right so that is the model that is clearly more and more realistic so in that model you have some firms that find it relatively easy to automate so those will be the first that do automate when interest rates fall and for some firms it's uh, more costly so they, those will be at the later stage and then you get this backward bending part so that would be the more realistic framework and that um yeah we basically we just showed that it looks the same so it's uh but um, mathematically, or just to, yeah, it's it's easier to make these points using this uh, this other model because it's we can every, derive all of the results in closed form. So that's why we use the other model. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> but um, you're right. So in our model, it will be it's very extreme. So the moment you cross the threshold, all firms are behaving in exactly the same way. So all firms are doing the same thing. So they will immediately all automate their production. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the second question you kind of, um, or the second thought you already addressed, which is, you know, there's a, obviously a lot of demands on the central bank to look beyond inflation, employment, you know, they now also have to model technolo technology, they have to model automation. So I was just sort of, um, you kind of touched on this by, by looking by, by saying that, you know, you, you compare the real wage to a benchmark. But, it, you know, there may be other things, I was sort of wondering, uh, a bit like Warwick, what, what other things the central bank has to look at to make sense <laughs> yeah. of, of, yeah, of, that's a good, of that's where a good we point. are. Yeah, yeah. So the, diff the steady states differ in terms of, um, so what is the same in the steady state is, is uh, employment and inflation. That's, that's all the same in all steady states. What is different is the real wage, like I said before, labor productivity. And also this, the capital stock, the size of the capital stock, 
and uh, as a result also investment. <clears throat> so investment is higher in the uh, steady state where you have a higher capital stock because you need more investment to sustain it. Um, so those are the, fa the, the things that you could look at as the central bank. So I've, from a practical perspective, it's probably easiest to look at uh, investment because that is something that you can measure. Um, but then it's still if your investment is, is some number in the data, you don't know if, if, if that's high investment or low investment. So of course it's still hard, it's still hard to say. <laughs> So I agree. From a practical perspective, I think there's no more work to be done. Okay. Thanks. It's also a particular type of investment, right? It's not just investment. It yeah. has to be a particular type of investment, which makes it even more difficult. Uh, okay, but but in the steady state, it's the usual type of investment. It's the it's the type of investment that sustains your your capital stock because the automation investment happens only at the threshold, right? So, but when once you are, once the automation once production processes are automated, they are produced with machines. So you have the usual type of investment that some of these machines break down, you have to replace them. So that's the usual type of investment. Excellent. Um, uh, Akshay, um, you want to have one last question because we're almost getting to uh, time. All right, okay. So, uh, just quick, so you can't have this situation, like the singularity situation, can you in this Martin, where you just, this JH star just converges to one or something? And, and labor just becomes completely redundant because of monetary policy. That's not possible. Well, well, uh, no, that's be, uh, that's by it's not possible by assumption because we assume that above an index JH you have to produce with labor. But oh, if you okay. make, <clears throat> but in Achimoglu's framework JH is actually endogenous. So firms, so it's a bit more complicated in his model. Firms can actually also uh, invest in order to discover new ways of automating uh, stuff. So, and then the JH is endogenous and can also increase over time. And he shows that there are equilibria <clears throat> where JH over time converges to one. So firms find it optimal to invest so much that eventually they, uh, eventually they will automate all production tasks. So he says that there are such equilibria, but he, he says uh, that the, these equilibria are not very plausible. The more plausible ones are where, um, firms automate some production tasks. So the JH mm -hmm. is increasing over time, but at the same time, there are new uh, production tasks popping up. So he calls this the reinstatement effect. So basically new jobs are, are being created uh, that are soaking up the workers that got replaced from these old industries. Like for instance, uh, there could be services like walking your dog that haven't existed in the past, but now people are getting paid for walking the dog of other people, right? So that's a, a new job that has been created um, uh, and uh, these jobs are soaking up workers that, uh, that got uh, uh, displaced from, from automation. So he says that <clears throat> in the long run, it's likely that um, even though there is automation, uh, it's, not, um, that, uh, it's not going to be the case that eventually nobody will work, but uh, it will still okay. be the case that uh, there, there is going to be work in the future. Okay. Thank you. I think we need to draw this session to a close now. So thank you so much, Martin, for your presentation. Um, you got up really early this morning when you first joined us. It was dark through your back window. Now the sun's coming up. And the now the sun's sun coming up, down yeah. here. <laughs> and we're, we're heading into sunset, so it's, um, it's nice that we can still do this even with, without the travel. So yeah. everyone, please join me in thanking Martin for his um, really interesting presentations and for actually Ozair and Oli and Warwick who had to go to another meeting um, for being here on the panel. Um, we will put a recording of this session up on our website and the CSEN website as well, I guess, um, in the next few days once, once that arrives. And um, we will also ask Martin to send the slides to us. There's a request for some slides there as well. So we can put them on our website as well. So okay. thank you very much. Good night. Yeah, thanks. Thanks a lot for having me. And sorry again for my voice, but uh, oh, um, no, fine. what can you do? Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Bye. Bye.